nine of us went to uh, St. Paul's Roman Catholic Church in Hamilton, uh, Massachusetts, uh, my upbringing, and uh, you know, they would sometimes uh, bring us up to, to talk to the priest, you know, and so um, uh, he would uh, ask, ask me a question, uh, and I, if, I did, if I just said yes, like he'd grab me by the ear, and it twist my ear, and it'd say, say, yes, father. And I, yes, father. <laughs> and I, I always have felt that these things that hang down from my ears are from him uh, uh, dis <laughs> disfiguring my countenance. Uh, <laughs> yes, father. You know, I, um, uh, I got saved on a dance floor, right? It, uh, there weren't a lot of follow-up, um, and uh, uh, so I was uh, bouncing around trying to find uh, where to, where to, how to serve God. And, but I, uh, six years I was saved before I came into the fellowship, and for those years I, uh, I was uh, at a Christian college, um, and uh, most of that time at a major, you know, uh, famous evangelical church in, in America. And you know, I only heard the word pastor once. Uh, now, uh, and, and where I heard it was at the church I was attending that uh, uh, a friend of mine who uh, had grown up in churches uh, uh, called the, the man that everybody else called Dr. Toms, called him Pastor Toms, and I had never heard those words put together before. Now think of this, I've, I've been in like Christian circles for all this time. Uh, you know how, what they say, you know, there's all these doctors around, you think that God was sick, right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then of course, you know, obviously that's saying something and, and and then, uh, but now with some, so much of the reference point for the leader of a church is like a CEO, uh, not really a pastor. And so uh, I, I think to the, one of the glories of our fellowship is the place, uh, the dignity that we give to the local pastor and his role. And as I was, this is actually a Christmas sermon, uh, pardon, uh, the, uh, I'm, I know I'm at the wrong time now, but uh, it, it moved me. Why did the shepherds get the most glorious revelation of the birth of Jesus, of anybody else? Maybe, I don't know, maybe, because heaven wanted to appreciate and elevate shepherds and thereby release shepherds to fill the earth to win souls and establish flocks of God, assemblies of God across the earth. So let's look at a very familiar passage. You've probably read it a bunch or heard it preached on a bunch to the last month, but uh, we'll start in verse eight of chapter two. Now there was in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord stood before them, uh, shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God on the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. The shepherds were the first 
Let's think about appreciation. Often when we think about uh, why the shepherds played so prominently in this the story of the birth of Jesus is uh, uh, Jesus is uh, uh, reaching down to the lowest rung of uh, society, perhaps that it's showing that uh, uh, he is uh, willing to associate with uh, uh, those of low degree, low estate. Sometimes uh, they're often termed as maybe despised people. That uh, Jesus was uh, uh, willing to come to these and minister, whatever the val validity of those thoughts might be. There is the thought that maybe they were invited by heaven because God wanted to send a message of how much he appreciates shepherds. And that's going to be a reference point for all Jesus is going to do for the next 2,000 years. See, to be the first invited to see Jesus was perhaps an expression of appreciation. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. That word, uh, they are guarding. They are guarding these sheep. They are living with them. They're guarding them from what? From wolves, from the lion, from the bear, from the thieves that break in and steal. Poime, poimeno, poimeno, sorry, they, the, the word for shepherd is to feed uh, or to shepherd. It can be translated either way, to rule, to, to tend a flock, to direct, or to also to guide and to heal. See, shepherds have represented God's own ministry to the people of God for years. Ezekiel says, as a shepherd looks for his sheep on the day he is among his scattered flock, so I will look for my flock, I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a cloudy and dark day. That's the heart of God. God's heart is a shepherd's heart. God's heart's a pastor's heart. The Messiah that is born in our story, it says, but to you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd, pastor, my people Israel. The prophecy about Jesus, he is going to be a, the shepherd, the pastor of his people. It's linked, of course, to David. And we think that David and Abraham and Moses, maybe the three most significant personalities in all the Old Testament, all of them were shepherds. That's not to be lost on us because that is a reflection of God's heart. The Lord is my shepherd. See, sheep, of course, represent the people of God, and that is not very complimentary to you and me. <laughs> um, I know we're God's army, and you know, I, I love it, that, that, that's great, but um, we are vulnerable creatures, <laughs> uh, not able to protect ourselves. Do you, do you get that? Like without shepherds, we're dead ducks. I guess that's mixing the metaphors, but anyway, you know, <laughs> dead meat. Uh, yeah, that's, I was going to say dead lamb. No, not uh, Brother Scott. No, and so, uh, like, uh, you know, so uh, we, like, if you don't have a shepherd, you are not going to survive, right? That's, that's what that means. Uh, Sheep are not able to make discernment, right? Sometimes they eat like really poisonous stuff, like YouTube. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so, uh, and, and you know what? They don't even uh, naturally even stay connected to their own flock, right? All we like sheep have gone astray, every one to his own way, not only uh, wandering from the shepherd, but wandering from the other sheep independent. See, we're talking about dealing with the frail and the flawed, the rebellious and the resistant, and still willing to feed them, protect them, <laughs> uh, guide them, and heal them. Heal them from what? Heal them when they mess up really bad, <laughs> when they get themselves really hurt, when people really hurt them. 
And we told you, I told you don't do it, and you did it, and now I have to help heal you with a right heart, with a shepherd's heart. Not I told you so, but to help and to heal. You know, when the shepherds arrived in that stable, uh, they probably didn't smell the greatest. They smelled like sheep, and they smelled like sheep stuff. <laughs> but you know what? That was okay, because probably in that stable, that's how Jesus smelt too. <laughs> See, the shepherds were abiding with their flock. Like that's the thing, that living with it. Not in your house necessarily, but, uh, but you know, living down where our folks live. That's crucial. This has been a challenging year for everybody. But there's been a particular challenge. I'm not saying the greatest. I know toilet paper manufacturers have been under a great deal of stress. But the, the, I know that, that for uh, that pastors and their wives have been under a particular stress and strain during this time. And I want you to know that Jesus appreciates you. Uh, it's, it's been tough. How to function, how to continue, what to do, what, what not to do. You have people in crisis, people that have been in financial crisis, in mental crisis, right? As we've heard all the things that are going on in people's minds because of this lockdown. Sickness, and of course, for some of us, like even death, people that are, we've loved in our congregation, it has been, and, and who is to be there to minister to those but the shepherd, the pastor, and of course, something about these times can bring all of life's disappointments to the fore of someone's mind. You know, when you think about the, the, uh, the spike in the suicide rate, that's obviously people are looking at their lives as far more miserable and unlivable than is reality. And even though some people don't take their lives, that may still be, they may still be viewing their life that way. And if they're Christians, sometimes they're going to blame you. So it's been a tough time sometimes for pastors, but Jesus wants you to know, like, they, they were the first. They were the first to see the Savior. That's an appreciation. I was reading about a uh, a Lausanne conference on uh, world evangelism happened a, a, a long time ago, but it somehow it's maintained some fame. And, and this man is writing about going to this. It was uh, sponsored by the Billy Graham Association, and pastors and evangelists and Christian leaders from all over the world came in, in, in Switzerland. And, and the man is talking about a, 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 they, they broke down into small groups, and uh, they shared what uh, what ministries they were from and uh, what they were doing and handed out, uh, you know, business cards of, uh, you know, to identify themselves. And, and he was t speaking about one uh, African uh, gentleman who was a, uh, a soft-spoken, uh, and uh, as he identified who he was, he said, I'm a pastor from Kenya. But as he would speak, he had such a profound uh, relationship with Jesus. There was some depth to him that uh, this man said. And he pictured him, you know, just ministering for the gospel in some small village uh, in Kenya. And on the flight home, uh, as he's going back to Canada, that's where he's from, he, he pulled out those business cards and, he, uh, and he's looking through who all these people were. And the man who identified himself as uh, a pastor from Kenya was actually Festo Olong, the Archbishop of Kenya. Now, you know, we're not into archbishops. Anybody who's got a position in the church above Jesus, the bishop, uh, obviously there's some problems. And yet, what, how he identified himself, this is what I'm going to, how I, I'm a pastor. 
that I care for people. That's my, not my position, right? This, his position was elevated before anybody else in that group. But let's think about elevation for a moment. Because not only were they the first to see the Savior, Jesus Christ, but they were given the most glorious presentation of Jesus coming. Right? What is described here is more glorious than the angel coming to Mary, the, the angel coming to, to Zechariah, or to, uh, or to Joseph, uh, uh, far greater than anything of the, that the Magi experienced. Listen to these words, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the, uh, the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying glory to God on the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That might be the, the most glorious uh, thing that has been re revealed in all of the, uh, history, what God has broken through with a multitude of the heavenly hosts and shown these people such glory to introduce the person of Jesus Christ. And of course, the, the incredible contrast of these, uh, which I'm sure we've all ministered on and, and, and heard sermons about, just the, the glory of the angel of the Lord and then a multitude of the heavenly host singing, right? It's got to be the most, uh, you know, glorious singing that any human ears have ever heard. And then it all comes down to this little frail baby. And there's the contrast, the glory and the frailty, right? The glory and the humility, right? The glory and it's in a person, the Son of God, a Savior who is Christ, Jehovah God. Like that's the, that's the contrast that all of us, well, need to deal with. We, we, we deal with the frailty. <laughs> we deal with the human limitation. But sometimes we lose sight of the glory. And you can't keep dealing with the limitation if you're not seeing the glory. So the shepherds. The shepherds are going to play, shepherds are going to play an indispensable role in all that God is going to do in the next 2,000 years. Remember, Jesus came, the Savior, who is Christ the Lord. He came to give his life a ransom for many. And he said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so everyone who is going to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, like on the day of Pentecost, all those 3,000 people are saved. And then the Bible goes on to say, and the Lord added to the church daily such as would be saved. And so what that's telling us is people who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, who Jesus died to save, they are to be in a local church under a local pastor. Like that ministry is crucial to what Jesus came to do. He came to build his church and he is going to use the shepherd, the pastor, to do this. A place where they can be fed and protected, healed and guided by a shepherd. God's purpose demands shepherds in order to be fulfilled. There are other ministries, I, I get that. I'm, not, I'm try, not trying to minimize, but the crucial role that a shepherd plays, everything that God does, he does out of the assembly. Right? The church is his purpose. That is the revelation that has set us apart. We see the dignity of the local church in a way that very few other 
ministries, organizations do, that out of the local church you can win souls, make disciples, plant churches, send ministry, uh, missionaries, reach the world. Not many people believe that. Or if they mouth it, they don't do it. But of course, all of that comes back. Who is, who is leading that thing of such dignity and value and worth in God's economy? The shepherd. See, Peter would preach a powerful sermon on the day of Pentecost. We remember, we remember that. 3,000 people saved, glorious thing. But if you remember Jesus' specific commission sometime before that, as he's seeking to recover this future pastor from blowing it pretty bad. And he said, Simon Peter, lovest thou me? Yes, Lord. You know. Simon Peter, then, then feed my sheep. Simon Peter, love us. Uh, yeah, yeah. Feed my lambs. Simon Peter, love us. Yeah. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. See, it'd be wonderful if we pastors didn't make any mistakes. Wouldn't that make life easier for our church? It's not going to happen. You know, um, but there's something about being able to minister to people, care for the people, that, that, the, 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 the failing, the frail, the faltering, and sometimes sheep bite. You know, Pastor Mitchell used to say, you know, ministry is feeding the hand that bites you. <laughs> and we're talking about feeding sheep, right? They, these, this is not, they're not always cooperative. But the issue comes down to, do you love sheep? And you need to love sheep. You need to love people. But above that, it is, do you love me? See, shepherds, pastors, everyone, uh, aspiring shepherds, uh, uh, aspiring pastors, it's your relationship with Jesus, right? It is having a revelation of the glory of who Jesus is. Here is the glorious Son of the living God, the second person of the Trinity, made flesh, right? Like, and, and represented with that frail little baby, but then represented uh, even further and more gloriously nailed to a cross, hands and feet in the most shameful and wicked and, and, and uh, 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 reproachful, uh, uh, reproach-riddled, shameful display. And here is in ultimate frailty, ultimate weakness, and yet it's the most glorious thing that has ever happened. Jesus Christ crucified for our salvation. That's our shepherd. That's our... That's the shepherd of our souls. You know, we can lose, we can lose a heart for people if we lose a heart for Jesus. If we're not maintaining our relationship with Jesus day in and day out, this time has been rough for all of us, but it's forced me more than any other time in my ministry, I think, to be on my knees day by day, numbers of times during the day. Uh, it's, we need Jesus. You know what, there was, uh, we had, uh, we were trying to work with a, uh, a dear woman of, uh, some time back. She had actually been a backslider from a, the church like from years and years ago before my wife and I even went there uh, 26 years ago for the first time. Drug addict, right, had, was now homeless, you know, and so she had come in 
gotten her heart right and we're trying to work with her and help her and get her into a, uh, got her into a shelter, right? She was living and so Janet, my wife, is, is working with her, trying to help her get her license so she can get a job and, and doing all of, well, you know, she, she broke some little rule you know, she was supposed to make her bed or something, or she, she didn't do it. And they kicked her out. They kicked her out on the street. And so, so Janet went to, her, to the, the lady running this thing and said, hey, I mean, can't you, like, she's doing it. She's trying. And, she, and, and then Janet said, so where, where's the love? And she said, it's not in the job description. Now, when you think about how the homeless are viewed in our, you know, like people's hearts, we're going to, I bet that woman got into that job originally because she cared for homeless people. She wanted to do something. She probably went in with a right heart, but yet guess what? It didn't survive. And you know what? We're no better than that woman. We can't point the finger because we would be the same way without Jesus keeping our hearts right with him. See, when Paul speaks to the Ephesian elders and pastors, he notes the source of their calling and assignment. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. The Holy Spirit has produced something in you to shepherd the flock of God. It is only as we continue to allow him to continue that work in us that we can keep our hearts. Hey, there's nothing in the job description to say I have to love you. I'm sorry there is. The job of resisting wolves, correcting false doctrine, keeping the vision of our leadership even though perhaps there's great distance. We're in the other part of the country or the other side of the world. But it's a pastor who's going to keep that church connected to our fellowship vision. It's got, to, it's got to burn in him or it's not going to ignite in his church. See, sometimes sheep aren't easy <laughs> to shepherd. Sometimes the shepherd has it, the, you know, the strategy of hell, smite the shepherd and scatter the sheep. And sometimes you get smitten in the minds of people. They talk, they criticize, they, they're, they get smitten. You get smitten in their minds and they're scattered. Remember years ago, Pastor Mitchell praying for, uh, uh, turned out it was a pastor uh, during one of our conferences. And, and he said uh, to the pastor, uh, is, there, is there someone that you need to forgive? And he said, yeah, who is that? My church. Uh, <laughs> See, we are under shepherds to the great shepherd. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Right, it's Jesus' heart has to be produced in us. We're not just going to come up with this by ourselves. Right, we can be do-gooders that just want to change the world and help. There's a lot of people out there that talk like that. But does it survive? Does it survive a collision with real human nature? with real fallen, broken, rebellious human nature, does it survive that? Not without a miracle of the Spirit of God keeping the character of Jesus growing in our hearts where our flesh wants to strangle it, bypass it. He says, shepherd the flock of God, among which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that doesn't fade away. See, Pastor, you haven't seen, I've done this for them, I've done that, I've done it, and they, 
I, I, I'm so grateful for appreciative people. I'm telling you, they can bring me to tears. But you can't, you can't live on that. You got to live on this. That no, okay, they didn't appreciate it. Maybe they put it back in my face. Well, however, maybe they could. There's, thank God for all the wonderful, supportive people that are in our churches. Thank God for them. But at the end of the day, it's like eternity. Jesus, I'm doing all of it. Yes, yeah, he knows that, and he appreciates it. And he's fashioning your crown. Just remember that. You know, there was a time when... Uh, when we were part of the denomination, uh, apparently that uh, Pastor Mitchell was offered some, uh, some denominational uh, position, some high denominational position. And, and uh, to do that, you, you know, you'd uh, not be a pastor anymore. You'd be in, a, in, a, uh, in an office somewhere and go around and speak. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we had a gentleman that was like that, used to come and speak to us years ago. And Pastor Mitchell refused. He said, no, I'm a pastor. And he said, he would tell us, you know, that's the problem with denomination. Like their leadership is, they aren't pastors anymore. Right? They're not dealing with real people. See, all of our leaders are pastors. Right? They maintain. Pastor Mitchell, up until the very last, is still ministering, teaching Sunday school, counseling, you know. You know, like a shepherd to the last. Not a bureaucrat. Right? Not a paper pusher. Right? It, is, it's a, it maintains a shepherd's heart. Like I close with an inspiration. You know, shepherds need a savior too. <laughs> Unto you <laughs> is born this day a savior who is Christ the Lord. Oh, yeah. I, get, I get it. <laughs> I need a savior. Thank God there is one. But it's that personal encounter with a Savior, and that glory begins to work in our lives. We are flawed people. <laughs> yes, you are. Don't. I don't. <laughs> but see, we we have our flaws. We have our imperfections. But <laughs> but we minister Jesus. He is able to move through. Here's, here's, here's Peter and John, you know. And the, the religious leaders see their flaws. They're unlearned and ignorant men. But they beheld their boldness and recognized they had been with Jesus. Our folks are going to see our flaws. But can they see that we've been with Jesus? Okay, that... That gives them hope. And also know you're in submission to your pastor, <laughs> to your shepherd. Then, hey, I'm not a loose cannon. I answer. You can trust me. It's interesting, Pastor Mitchell, telling us back uh, some time ago of, uh, that sometimes it's the, the disciples <laughs> that maybe struggled the most in their discipleship and struggle the most with issues as they were in the church. But sometimes they made the best pastors. And that the, the superstar disciples, <laughs> the guys that, you know, dotted all the T's, no, dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. <laughs> Somehow they just couldn't relate to our, us mortals, you know. And they couldn't shepherd people because they hadn't really faced their own issues. See, what Jesus wants is the earth filled with shepherds. We talk about the call to preach. And we believe that. And we know that sometimes that relates to, say, an evangelist. And, and thank God for that. We can't do what we do without the evangelist. Right? That, without the evangelist, there is a crucial level of ministry that is not going to come through the pastor. But what Jesus wants is to fill the earth with preachers 
of, in churches. <laughs> so to call to preach, the call to preach is the call to preach to churches, to a church, a call to shepherd. We don't often think of it that way, but that's really what we're saying. The call to preach is a call to shepherd, care for church. See, Jesus' heart, the, the, his, the word for compassion here, is so, it, it, it's like an a, a inner spasm. He says when he saw the multitudes, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The lost need a shepherd. Pastor Williams did such an outstanding job last night, a masterpiece. Like these, uh, the, the lost. But though the lost... Who, when the sheep is found, and he talked about putting that sheep on your shoulders, bearing the burden, and he talked about financial burden, but there is the burden of ministry. I am going to take this sheep into the place where it can be cared for, healed, directed, guided, fed. See, these men left this encounter motivated. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. The glory of the Son of God, the glory what they had seen displayed in the heavens, and then the glory of seeing, in, this is now represented by this little, hours old, moments old baby. To fill the earth. I, they went everywhere talking about what the angels had said concerning this child. See, sheep need shepherds. Sheep are harassed and helpless. Sheep will wander away and die. Jesus looked at the lost and said, they're sheep without a shepherd. This weak brother... Can you respond to the call to shepherd? The lost need a shepherd. Will you commit yourself? Will you be stirred by what Jesus has done inside of you? Will you be stirred by the example that your pastor has set for you and how he has invested in your life? And you would, you'd be probably in an, an insane asylum, some of us without our pastors or hanging in a closet right we're talking about can you would you be that one would you represent his spirit in the earth can you be moved by the shepherd's heart of Jesus Jesus I'm the good shepherd I lay down my life for the sheep will you oh Lord I want to be to be like Jesus to be like Jesus all I want to be like lay your life down for the sheep say Jesus I want your heart produced in me and and you don't have that you can pray it into your God will do it for you he wants you to have his heart Pray for a shepherd's heart. God, give me a shepherd's heart. The Holy Spirit made you overseers. There's an appointment thought there, but there's also a development thought there. It was something that the Holy Spirit was doing in them, producing in them the character of Jesus Christ that made, that's what made them to be the shepherds that they needed to be. It's a supernatural thing. And see, the, the, the words, the first words that were spoken to these first people who got to see Jesus it needs to be maybe the words that you hear this morning beside, ahead of everything that I've said so far. Do not be afraid. Brother, do not be afraid. Future pastors, what? Do not be afraid. They bite. Yeah, I know they do. <laughs> but do not be afraid. They smell. I, I know. But do not be afraid. It's also, there's nothing more glorious. There's nothing, our joy and crown of rejoicing. Yes, people can, but, they, but to see lives transform, change, fulfilling destiny, there's no greater thing in all of life.
See, shepherds can exercise dominion. Here's Moses, right? He's, he's going to be a deliverer. Right? This is the thing. And, he, and, and he's fighting it, man. He's like, no way. No, not happening. And so God says, what's in your hand? A rod. But what was that? It was a shepherd's rod. See, the thing that he had used to shepherd people now became an instrument of deliverance, of parting the Red Sea, of bringing water under the, out of a rock, of being held up so Joshua can fight the Amalekites. See, there's something about our caring for people, ministering for people, praying them through. There's a confidence that God will fulfill his word. That's what these men had. Verse 20 in one translation said, the shepherds went back to work. The shepherds went back to work glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen, which happened just as they had been told. You can trust this book. If you'll do what Jesus tells you to do from this book, if you'll embrace the, the, the privilege of being able to care for the precious people of God, he loves his bride. He loves his church. He loves his flock. The day that uh, Pastor Mitchell passed away, um, I was getting a lot of texts and things from people, but uh, I, was, I was pretty torn up. Um, I ended up saying, just sending this to our pastors and some of the men in our area. Excuse me, I, his, his preaching and his spirit st stirred hope that God could use a very common man like me. He believed in me even though I was odd. He thought better of me than I thought of myself and opened the door to destiny for me. His example has been a reference point on countless occasions when I didn't know how to proceed, but I knew the kind of man I needed to be. His counsel has guided me through rough waters, some of my own making and some that the ministry has demanded me that I navigate. His unwavering commitment to our vision has stood like a lighthouse, showing the way past the shoals of religion. When he saw me, he would say, here's my friend Kevin Foley, and he would put a descriptor before my name that is actually too embarrassing to tell you right now. <laughs> I knew he loved me. When I got Pastor Greg's text that he had passed, I began to weep in sadness. But then when I thought of the end of his pain, betrayals, slanders, tragedies, heartbreaks, and indefatigable labors, I began to weep for joy for him. Once at breakfast I said to him, talking about our life, this is not our destiny, meaning what we're having to deal with and see now. And he said, thank God for that. <laughs> he now begins to taste the exceeding weight of glory that God has prepared for him. Well done from the lips of Jesus Christ to one of his finest servants ever. Pastor, it's worth it. It's worth it. Take up the challenge to be a shepherd. Amen. That's all that I have today. <laughs>